postage program. Uh, and you can see, uh, you know, the track record in terms of, uh, you know, the publication um, of our um, researchers uh, going from 2007 uh, in, in a steep uh, gradient uh, to 2010 when we started the um, HIR work, uh, uh, which finished actually it's a, a five year program. So it finished in 2014, 15. And you can see the rise in the number of publication and the percentage in the uh, Q1 uh, docu um, uh, in the Q1 uh, publications. Okay, so in 2007, uh, 2010, when we first started, the percent uh, of uh, Q1 publication was just about 16, about six, uh, 17 percent. But by the time uh, the publication, um, uh, the HIR program ends, our percentage of uh, publication in Q1 has risen to about 28 to 29%. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is to show you, you know, the quality in the Q1 document, but we are looking at uh, the numbers as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is just to, ex to show you that after the uh, HIR program, we continue to sustain the research uh, output by our researchers where our Q1 uh, documents in the index journal remain high, um, well, not as high as we would like, but it's still, uh, it's still good uh, at 30%. We would like to enhance this further, but, you know, at least we know that, uh, you know, this program is sustaining the quality of uh, work that is being done in the University of Malaya. Next, please. Uh, just to show you amongst the Q1 uh, percentage, we are looking at the top 10% uh, and the top 1% of the Q1 uh, uh, publications, uh, index publication, and we see in 2010, uh, we were publishing uh, about 7 or 8% uh, in our top 10 uh, journals, top 10% journals, sorry, and by the, uh, by 2014, the amount, the numbers, or the percentage uh, has risen to about 12, uh, 12 to 13% in top 10% journals. Uh, while uh, we look at the top 1% journal, um, it has actually risen to about 2% from, you know, way before, below, <laughs> below zero, but about 2.2 or 2.3% in the top 1% uh, journal. So, uh, we are actually uh, moving towards uh, quality uh, in this case. Okay, so next, please. Next, uh, okay. I think uh, next. Not this one, I think. Uh, yeah. So we this is uh, to look at you know how we actually uh, perform during those times uh, before the uh, HIR uh, in 2007 between 2007 to 2010. If you look at our publication and collaboration, most of our collaboration were were with the UK uh, and China uh, mainly. And uh, the percentage in Q1 papers from this collaboration actually uh, are within, uh, below, uh, except for the ones in US, are below uh, 30%, okay? Uh, but the uh, index, uh, sorry, the C CNCI, okay, are all uh, below two, below two at this point, uh, you know, um, the highest being the one with US at 1.7. During the HIR, we see the numbers of, uh, you know, publication rose, uh, of course, uh, with UK still leading uh, in terms of our collaboration, but uh, you see also the percentage of Q1 uh, uh, publication increased uh, substantially uh, in some cases, uh, especially with China, and also the CNCI has also increased, and a new, uh, new group of uh, researchers working with the Saudis are also coming in although the CNCI is still low. But uh, you see the CNCI uh, for the work that is being collaborated with the US has actually uh, risen to below, uh, to above two uh, in, uh, during that, that period. And uh, past that period, which is 2015, we still see uh, you know, a good uh, amount of collaboration with all these countries, uh, except that Indonesia has uh, lagged out uh, but you see the numbers of documents that has been pu published in the top uh, 10% has uh, increased and percentage in, uh, sorry, yeah, percentage in Q1 uh, has also increased uh, dramatically. 
uh, with the CNCI also increasing. So this is actually uh, quite good for us because it indicates that the research is still going on and it's still uh, of good uh, quality. Next, please. So uh, today we have two of our recipients of HRR, I mean, illustrious recipient, uh, Prof. Saad, who's uh, currently the Dean of uh, Faculty of Engineering, and you heard from uh, Dijun just now uh, that he is a three-year running highly cited researcher for Clarivet uh, Analytics. And we also have uh, Dr. Chan, Associate Doc, Professor Dr. Chan Yok Fan, who's the head of uh, microbiology at the Faculty of Medicine. She is a uh, award-winning, uh, you know, uh, person. She actually was uh, Malaysia's uh, L'Oreal UNESCO International Rising Talent Award winner. Previous, sorry, next, uh, before. Uh, and a Young Woman Leader Award category uh, for the National Council of Women Organization Malaysia. And recently, last year, she won the Asian Women Entrepreneur Leadership Award um, in Science and Environment. So these two are actually a recipient of HIR and they probably will discuss with you, uh, you know, how, uh, how they go about uh, on their journey. Next, please. <clears throat> okay. Just to show you, uh, you know, how we put things in place. Um, University of Malaya started having a research management uh, unit, a research ma management center quite early in 1995. Uh, so, although our research has always uh, been before that, but, you know, uh, formally uh, getting, you know, big grants only started quite late in 1995 and we had to put things in place. Uh, and, uh, you know, we also started with the, uh, once we get the research university status, we had to uh, enhance our research management uh, uh, unit and, uh, you know, and services. And uh, in 2010, uh, we actually received the uh, HR, HR um, uh, program, uh, and that was actually fully supervised by the vice chancellor at the time. Uh, so that, uh, the vice chancellor then was uh, Tan Sri Gauss. Um, who initiated the you know, research cluster that we have now in the University of Malaya, uh, which was set up to address multi inter and transdisciplinary research to allow our researchers to cross discipline and work with other researchers outside their discipline. And he also initiated the HIR program, which began in 2010, to address the need for UM researchers to strive for excellence uh, so that we have you know, enough um, uh, capability infrastructure which uh, will enable our researchers who we know could actually be pushed forward, uh, particularly in the fundamental research area to actually achieve excellence. Next, please. <clears throat> so the structure then follow this strategy, uh, we actually uh, uh, initiate, you know, uh, and revise, uh, you know, our structure, organization structure on how we do things. We now have a, a, a fully developed research management uh, system, uh, research management center that helps our researcher with full uh, pre and uh, post award. Uh, and also we look at, you know, their requirement in terms of, uh, you know, central management uh, uh, facilities, as well as, uh, you know, intensive computing center that, uh, you know, some of our researchers need. Uh, we also uh, have under us, uh, you know, uh, commercialization unit or tech transfer office. Uh, also consultancy and uh, and um, liaison uh, office for uh, work with industry as well as community. The HIR uh, program actually ended, but you know the uh, unit is still under uh, the purview of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation. That actually looks into you know all the uh, output as well as you know the facilities that was actually uh, acquired during um, the HIR to enable them to actually still fully function to assist our uh, researchers. Next, please. The other things that we did uh, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to help is actually to uh, provide some support entire the research value chain uh, in terms of upstream uh, funding opportunities that we get uh, in, the, in terms of processes and uh, uh, um, laboratories and equipment, central laboratories and equipment and publishing support uh, that, that may be needed. Uh, we, we became a partner to Enago to help our researchers improve their chance in publication sub, uh, success. Uh, and we also uh, provide some downstream um, uh, 
services uh, in terms of our office of uh, industry and community engagement to help them uh, disseminate this uh, information to the community and industry. Next, please. And uh, the other thing that we did was also to enhance our talents uh, because we do have uh, quite a strong uh, number of uh, professors, but we also have strong number of uh, young talents, one of whom is uh, Dr. Chan, uh, homegrown, you know, she did her, her whole, whole work uh, uh, study from undergraduate all the way to, uh, I think, her graduate uh, work in the University of Malaya. And, uh, you know, we do have quite substantial number of those talents still in the University of Malaya. So we wanted to actually enhance them and make sure that their talents are, are there uh, noticed and also uh, being uh, elaborated further. So we uh, have this uh, unit called ADAC. Uh, it is uh, Academic Advancement uh, Development Center uh, that actually helped to, uh, uh, you know, nurture the academic and institutional leader uh, in the university. And uh, we provide, uh, you know, courses, training, uh, and all kinds of things um, to the this, uh, researchers. So uh, if you asked, um, uh, you know, University of Malaya is uh, the fact that University of Malaya has gone up, uh, you know, in terms of its productivity of late, is it by accident or by design? We would like to feel that it is by design. Uh, because we try to put as much possible uh, as possible things in place so that we can actually pull out and enhance as well as nurture our researchers that have all these talents that are hidden and uh, you know that needs to be pulled out and actually uh, be used for the global use uh, benefit okay so i think that is the last of my slide thank you very much uh dijun uh julin sorry Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Nusada, for the insightful presentation. So, uh, let me just... So, um, next up, we have two distinguished researchers from UM to share with us their journey and vision as well-established researchers. First up is Professor Dr. Sa'ad McCliff. Professor Dr. Sa'ad McCliff is the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Director of Power Electronics and Renewable Energy Research Laboratory. He authored and co-authored more than 400 publications in journals and proceedings, and five books with more than 24,000 citations. She ha he has been listed by Clarivate as one of the highly cited engineering researchers in the world in 2018, 2019, and 2020. He is actively involved in industrial co consultancy for major corporations in the power electronics and renewable energy projects. His research interest includes power conversion techniques, control of power converters, maximum power point tracking, MPPT, renewable energy and energy efficiency. I'm sure all of us are looking forward to hear from you, Professor Syed. So the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introductions and thank you very much also for for inviting us to this session. Uh, Clarivate, thank you. And uh, I would like to share my screen first. Huh? Okay. Is it clear now? Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, uh, I think Prof. Nasada have given a very uh, comprehensive um, introductions to the university strategy on terms of research and terms of publication and focus. And I was invited to give my own personal experience. So, you know, uh, I'm just going to talk about myself and how uh, University of Malaya actually helped me in uh, in my career and to achieve what I have achieved so far. Uh, I came to Malaysia very uh, in 1995, you know, more than 25 years ago, you know, and uh, during that time, you know, I came here, you know, for the objective to continue my studies, but uh, it was very tough time because during that time I cannot speak English because I studied all in in French. So when I came here, the main of the main obstacle or the main challenge is how I'm going to to, to do my research, you know, and to write papers in English. And um, 
just to share with you, many of my supervisors uh, during the time, which I have approached to be my supervisors, all uh, declined because they, they cannot see, you know, because I always uh, work with a translator who helped me to translate actually what I want to do, you know. So, but uh, finally I found a supervisor who guided me to, to, to finish my master's. And um, surprisingly, after one year, I managed to publish my first paper in 1997. And later on, I, I joined as lecturers after uh, uh, I finished 99 University of Malaya and start doing uh, publications as a part of our research. But the focus during that time was more into proceedings because there was no clear directions on um, where we should target or where we should focus on our research. And then uh, being the lecturer, so I also registered for my PhD. So I do teaching and also doing research for my PhDs and start uh, writing papers. I managed to publish my first Q1 papers in 2003, you know, it's Q1, which is in top 5%, you yeah? know. But it was, again, not our focus, yeah? because you can see uh, we tend to publish more conference papers because the publication process is quite smooth. And uh, uh, it's, it's a good opportunity for us, for example, to travel different locations, meet different uh, people, learn from them and so on and so forth. So it was not uh, the target, the, what I call, the, it was not really there for publishing in high impact journals. And then during the time also, I um, established my lab, which is uh, the PERL, which we call it the Power Electronics and Renewable Energy Research Laboratory in 2009. And I start uh, recruiting students, PhD students and masters. Okay, in 2009, when Tansley Gauss came as the Vice Chancellor of University of Malaya, uh, he made the things very clear to everyone at the, at the university. I think he has uh, gone around uh, the world looking to what are the practices and what are the, the modes of um, uh, publishing or whatever, you know. So when he make it very clear, he won ISI journal papers, Web of Science journal papers. So that was the shock for all of us because we we were publishing anywhere in Scopus, in uh, conferences. Suddenly, uh, okay, the guidelines is okay. We won ISI papers. Many many of us were taken by surprise. Uh, some of uh, my colleagues, our colleagues, uh, didn't accept the idea, but I. I was among the people who uh, want to take the challenge, you know. I just want to tune my research towards what the management of the university wants. The good thing about it is uh, he, uh, he provides the support. The University of Malaya provides the support, which is in form of uh, HIR. And that's actually uh, one of the very golden, I call it the golden opportunities. Again, when uh, we, uh, we asked to apply for the HIR grant, the KPI was to publish in Q1 papers. Again, some of the colleagues or and even myself who were very reluctant and also were very scared of the KPI set for the HII. Uh, but again, I have decided to take the challenge and uh, we took the grant. I took two projects, which was very uh, tough uh, with amount of almost 4 million. And we start recruiting PhD students, and that's helped us actually of um, getting good quality talents. Okay, and uh, we guide them, and we uh, start uh, what I call uh, collaborating. Because one of the criteria to receive an HIR grant, you have to have international collaborators. So we start doing the networks, and that helps me actually. By um, uh, what what helps me during that time is my connections during uh, conference presentations, which I have attended. So I start inviting my collaborators, mainly from Japan, uh, from uh, Australia. Uh, that's the, the first batch of my collaborators. So we start working together and uh, doing quite well, you know. We, during the time, during this uh, five years period, we managed to publish uh, uh, 126 journal papers, uh, 94 of them are high impact, which is Q1 papers. And then the momentum is remains, the momentum remains because we have students who continues from the HIR and uh, 
continuous uh, their uh, PhDs and also postdocs. So we also continue our uh, hiring more PhDs. We were more focusing on PhDs. You can see during the HIR, actually, we hire uh, masters, but to, uh, uh, after the HIR, my focus was more on two PhDs. PhDs. And then we start building the network further, where we have uh, more than 28 countries, actually, we work. I know it's uh, maybe it looks um, it looks uh, very uh, the numbers looks very huge, but uh, uh, and impossible to be done by one person. That's why this is actually a teamwork. It's a collective work. So it's not my own hundred uh, percent work, but it is. We work as a team. You know, we form a team at the Faculty of Engineering, and we work as a team. And that's what make uh, us achieve these numbers. And uh, uh, I think we have start seeing the fruits of this in terms of citations, in terms of um, people approaching us to collaborate from different countries and so on and so forth. So our next target is uh, try to maintain or uh, keep the momentum because we have the momentum, we have the talents, we want to keep these talents. So our main focus, still we target the top 5% of the key one papers. So that's still our main targets because that's actually what uh, attracts the citations, the quality, you know. So, uh, and also we're still um, looking for good talent and also trying to work with industries because that's actually one of the sources because now the, the issue is the funding. So we need to get more funding to maintain or to retain the talents. And uh, also working with other uh, colleagues from different uh, disciplines, for example, from computer science, from uh, faculty of science, from faculty of economics, so we try to uh, widen our scope of work and research to, to have more collaborators. So just to give you some breakdown and see the impact of uh, HIR on my personal uh, career, you know, you can see if, uh, from these slides in, in terms of uh, uh, Q1. So currently uh, more than 50% of my papers are in Q1 uh, journals. And that's actually due to HIR. If you look into this Q1, you can see actually 50 almost 45 percent are during hir era and the uh, 49 percent post hir era and even the q2 also 72 percent is a post hir actually which is the momentum actually which is the the students actually who been hired during hir continue to work because uh, hir actually uh, is, was extended for one year to 2016 so actually, that's uh, that's uh, the good things. So if you look into the areas of my uh, publications or my area of work, actually, you can see mainly on the power electronics, the two, which is more than um, eight, almost 80 percent of uh, other areas uh, for mainly power electronics and renewable energy. And then we have uh, other areas, which is actually this is mainly on the collaborations with other uh, faculties and other expertise. Okay, I like these slides, you know, I keep always keep updating these slides to show my networks and my collaborators where they are. And I'm always adding the dots, you know, uh, red dots and then counting the number of institutions and the number of uh, co-authors. And if you look into here, uh, this is the blessing of the HIR where actually we managed to reach almost everywhere. Okay, from the, what you call, uh, South America in Chile, you know, we work with some colleagues from Chile. We have published around seven papers together with two institutions, with uh, Canada. But my main uh, collaborators are in Australia, Japan, Saudi Arabia, uh, India, and so on. So this is shows the, the impact of collaborations. And uh, we, every day, we're still receiving invitations to collaborate receiving invitation to apply for uh, for research grant together. You know, recently we, we make an application with the Russian institution, you know, to apply for very large uh, research grants under the, the Russian uh, uh, called, uh, Ministry of Science. We apply in Australia for quite a number of uh, research grants. In Saudi Arabia also we apply for research grants and so on. So the good things when you have this um, uh, visibility, you know, when you have the, the visibility on terms of number of Q1 papers, people will start approaching you. And then we will also have uh, a large number of PhD students who want to do PhD with us. Uh, but now our focus 
in mainly on how to to secure funds. If you ask me, I spend most of my time now uh, looking into funds in from different sources because that's the only way how you can maintain the group or you maintain the 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 research team. You no, know? because uh, HIR helped us into uh, providing us with the very uh, good facilities. We purchased very high end equipment which put us in power with our uh, collaborators uh, and the competitors. But now, cost, which is the special, uh, salaries for our uh, postdocs, uh, our uh, PhD students and masters. So we spend most of the time. So uh, I think that's all for me. I would be happy to take uh, questions or, uh, but uh, this is my own personal experience, may not be the best experience for everyone, but I'm just sharing with you. Maybe you find something useful in it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Prof. Saad, for giving us a glimpse into what it takes to become a highly cited researcher and also a glimpse at how the high impact research has helped you reach out into the world. <laughs> so uh, we will have questions for you, definitely. I see a lot of questions coming in already. So the questions will be at the end of the session um, from the audience. So now for our final speaker, uh, Dr. Chan Yok Fan. Associate Professor Dr. Chan Yok Fan is currently the head of the Department of Medical Microbiology, Faculty of Medicine at University Malaya. Her research has been focusing on developing vaccines, antivirals, and educational tools for highly preventable disease common in children. With more than 20 years of research experience, she has over 90 publications and has been involved in many research programs and grants at both national and international levels. She has received numerous awards, including the ASEAN US Science Prize for Women 2020, Asian Women Entrepreneur Leadership Award for Science and Environment in 2019, Young Women Leaders Award in the category of Science and Technology, National Council of Women's Organization Malaysia in 2015, and a few more. These awards have given her the opportunity to promote women in science in Malaysia. So now I will pass the time over to Dr. Chan to share her experience so far. Dr. Chan. Hi, thanks, uh, Julian. Um, I'm sure you can hear me, right? All right. So um, I'm also tasked to actually share my academic journey in this particular uh, seminar. So um, similar to uh, Prof. Saad, I have divided my journey to three parts. Um, when I started my career, uh, the startup and uh, how I established and the challenge I meet um, in my academic career in the beginning. And uh, it was also during uh, the HIR era that uh, it actually helps to build and grow my research and uh, subsequently now what's next and how do I sustain and uh, make an impact. And um, so as mentioned by Prof. Nosada, I'm very much a local um, girl, so I graduated from a uh, Bachelor of Biomedical Science in Faculty of Medicine 999 uh, with major in Medical Microbiology. And I went on to do my PhD with Prof. Sazavi in uh, also Department of Medical Microbiology in Virology. And uh, of course, it was very nice then that you actually get scholarships from the government. And um, I graduated in 2006 and uh, and subsequently, uh, uh, I, I was hired um, as an academic in the Department of Medical Microbiology. And, um, you know, starting a lab, um, I was given a position, but I wasn't given a lab space as well as funding. So um, I was lucky enough in my first year, I actually get a 7,500 grant, which I actually could buy my first equipment, such as pipettes and centrifuges, uh, one, one tiny centrifuge for my PCR. And uh, much later, um, I got my lab space. And uh, of course, you know, uh, my lab space over here with uh, some of my students. And uh, I also was very lucky to, to strike my first collaboration with uh, uh, not Siti Nohaliza, but with uh, Jamal, who is my clinical colleague. Uh, and uh, from there onwards, uh, uh, I think we 
we have been working together for last oh, I don't know, 10 to 12 years and uh, we have a team now of seven people. So uh, I think very much uh, I would like to stress that, you know, a lot of my research is really bottoms up and uh, students make play a main role. They help me to strive together. So this is one of my first PhD student and now he's uh, uh, in Duke and US and uh, he has his nature biotech paper. And uh, this uh, Cholo is my first uh, FYP final year students. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad that he's still with me till today. And uh, Kam Ling, who, is a, who was first came into my lab, was a bioinformatics student who knew nothing about lab work and, and uh, graduated. And now is actually a PhD student in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, Chun Wei is uh, did PhD and finished off with uh, now working in Kaijun. Uh, Nadia uh, uh, worked very hard to do uh, many, many um, essays uh, in the lab for me. And now it's a research officer. And of course, uh, oh, you can see the face here. Uh, Anthony, who actually just secured his postdoc in uh, Switzerland. So I think my role in 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 building them is actually uh, as a role model, support, inspire, motivate, um, uh, or lead, uh, empower them. So um, so I I think um I don't have huge number like props are at, but but um I'm I'm glad you know um they they play a part in how I progress as well, my growth as well, and how I establish my lab and uh today uh you know uh. Those are the number of master, 50 master students and PhD that I have. And uh, I also continue to squeeze uh, interns who come to my lab and undergraduates for final year students. And uh, I also always encourage effective science communication and uh, become voices of young scientists to global science academy and young scientists network. And um, so I, I also believe in you know building my research by staying focused. So I am actually just a biologist. I never move on to other things, and uh, and I believe I will remain as one because uh, as what Warren Buffett has said, you know, um, the difference between successful people and really successful people is that really successful people say no to almost everything, and we should always focus um, what you should understand what you should focus on, just like what you should not. So uh, I always stay really focused in my research and uh, I also stay with my strong passion. And um, as I look back, uh, I realize, you know, uh, you work on significant important problem is very important. It has helped me to garner recognition in the field. For example, you can see I started off with uh, trying peptides to, for enterovirus and, and I went on to move on. I found a receptor for, for the virus. And I actually uh, characterize them what uh, to understand what what the virus binds to in the cells, and subsequently, you know, uh, it got me into high impact papers, which actually uh, we understand why now, you know, it actually uh, uh, cause pathogenesis. What how it actually do that? So I think it's important to actually stay passionate and. Uh, I truly believe in what Albert Einstein said. It's not that I'm so smart, but it's just I stay with my problems longer. So, uh, and how do I go my research? I, I I also believe in being hungry. So, as what uh, Prof Saad alluded, um, we 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 really are very hungry for funding. And I was really after HII, I realized you know funding has gone really limited, and uh, I foresight that funding is not going to come anymore. So, so I actually, you know, work out to get funding from elsewhere. So I tried, you know, uh, of course, you know, a lot of luck, but, you know, uh, luck only favor the prepared mind. So I actually always try to understand how, how actually people win the award. So when I actually tried to apply Laurier UNESCO, I, I studied, you know, what, what is the field they want and what is the subject they want and, and how to get there. So, so um, yeah, it was, I was lucky enough to get Laurel UNESCO National Fellowship in 2014, and that leads me to the uh, uh, International Award uh, in 2015. And uh, later, I also received a Newton Advanced Fellowship uh, in town with uh, UNICEF St. Andrews. And uh, this year, I was also working very hard during COVID time to actually earn my Asian US Science Prize for women. 
So um, I think to sustain my research, I have done a lot of different things. You know, I have um, I have stayed curious in the field. I I use different technology. I ask what is important in my field. I use different ways. I use uh, uh, I know that you know I must ask important questions. So I use different ways. Like if you can see in these slides, I try uh, I try different ways like using phylogenetics, uh, try antivirals, reverse genetics, proteomics, next generation sequence, all this to actually, um, you know, give me, help me to move forward my research. So uh, with, with that, uh, I I also have a map here, which actually shows um, my uh, previous and active collaboration currently. And uh, of course, I was lucky enough uh, to get uh, grants from different ministry, uh, international grants such as Newton Fellowship and uh, Defense Prep Reduction Agency uh, from US. And I also get small grants to work with industry like Ansel Glove, uh, 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 diagnostic company, and so on. So with that, um, uh, I'm 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 glad that I publish um, in different aspects. Uh, you know, uh, from epidemiology to diagnostics to prevention and treatment, uh, and uh, all these receive good uh, citations as well. So, uh, of course, you know, for for us as academic, how do we give back? So, uh, you know, uh, giving back to academic or giving back to community. So, of course, I'm an active uh, grant reviewer. So, I also have to review welcome fellowship. Uh, uh, a grant from DP, which is from Indonesia. Uh, I also help uh, UAE, uh, Jasan University to do their grant application, Hong Kong as well. So I am currently um, uh, the associate editor for BMC in diseases uh, and post nuclear tropical diseases. So these are good journals in, in my area of expertise. And uh, I also believe in, you know, like I say, uh, voices of young scientists, uh, which are involved in, in uh, Encouraging STEM uh, and in community work, where I actually encourage uh, prevention of Kusha family, and uh, I have always, uh, you know, tried to put myself into uh, answering. I mean, uh, in in science media and in uh, magazines and so on and newspapers. So um, I just want to highlight here, you know, um, and also all those awards that I have received uh, actually really helped me uh, to contribute back to the society. And uh, it also helps me to improve uh, visibility of uh, women in science. And uh, of course, you know, uh, one of the statements uh, I, I could not uh, not remember is uh, in the uh, uh, Laurie UNESCO Rising Talent uh, uh, meeting was, we are always remembered that uh, we are here not to celebrate women scientists, we are celebrating exceptional scientists who happens to be women. So um, with that, uh, I just uh, future and uh, I it's a summary of what I said just now. And, um, you know, um, I think uh, the right attitude, uh, taking the challenge, do things that scares you, you know, uh, and always remember that, uh, you know, if you want to choose anything to do, you always ask yourself, how difficult can it be? You know, you, you just tell yourself you can do it. And, you know, when you're struggling, you're actually learning and always aim high and do it well. And that's really the attitude. So you can see um, I put a big bubble in my in the me. So it's all really about you. And uh, if you want to grow in your academic journey, and of course, uh, it's also your science. So we really need to make sure we work on biological significant problem. We stay focused on what is important in the field, uh, do good science to ensure, you know, uh, ethical conduct, important, relevant, impactful uh, research. We uh, share our regions, uh, share, uh, stay hungry and uh, ensure, you know, we innovate and advance the science. So, and of course, you know, uh, we, we can't do that. Uh, we can't go anywhere if our institution does not support us. So, of course, you know, uh, it has been great and I wish, you know, the continuous support of my institution to bring the best out of me. Uh, and, of course, you know, to continue support in terms of opportunities, admin, finance, when we ask and then they will give, you know, and, you know, um, and, um, also, uh, you know, with KPI and so on, they really let us do what we are good at. You know, if we are good in teaching, let us teach. You know, when we are good, you let us do research and so on. And, you know, um, 
Also, you know, little things like KPI, it doesn't kill you, but it just makes you stronger. So um, I, I think university really, you know, have uh, should have foresight of, you know, vision for us and uh, leads us to the future. So uh, with that, uh, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chan. So now we will move on into the panel discussion session. And uh, to moderate this session, we have Mr. Lee In Bing from Clarivate, and we are inviting back Prof. Prof. Sat Art and Dr. Chan for this session. Hi. Uh, Julie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good, thank you. Uh, shall I start? Yes, please proceed. Right. Thank you, uh, the, the distinguished panelist, Professor Nosada. Thank you for sharing the impact of HIR, making absolutely clear the objective of the program is to improve, to, to increase the profile of University Malaya researcher as well as the university, and also shared about that journey, how uh, your office support this new culture of research excellence to sustain it, to help it grow even further. And I'm sure the audience would agree, both uh, Prof Saad and Associate Professor Chan are successful researcher in their own right. Uh, I'm sure the audience wants to hear more, especially what will take, what will it take and how to become as successful as you are as, as high impact and high performing researcher like yourself. Uh, without further ado, let's kick off our panel discussion and give what our audience want. And the first question uh, I'd like to ask the panelists is, what is the essential blueprint or the recipe you must for establishing a culture of research excellence? From first, let's address a uh, look from the university leadership perspective, after which we'll follow up with the researcher perspective. Prof. Nosada, you want to go ahead? Thank you, uh, Inbing. Um, to me, the the main main um, ingredient in the recipe is actually talent. We really have to have good talents and good researchers, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Chan mentioned. You know, hungry researchers. Who want to move forward. Once we have this, uh, we can actually try to look for support uh, or ways to support them so that they can actually come up with the best and propel themselves forward. Um, even if we have a lot of funding, uh, you know, but we do not have the talents or the researchers with, uh, you know, good ideas and good talents, uh, we will not be able to move. So I would like to actually um, say that the main ingredient in, uh, is um, is the talent and I think our success is actually also due to the talents that we have. The university is just there uh, to help uh, spearhead this and provide as much assistance as possible uh, when we could. Uh, and it's not been a very easy journey for most of us because we know, um, you know, fundings are not easy to, to manage or to be able to, uh, to come by, but we try to assist as much as possible in uh, whatever way we can. Thank you for that. Uh, Prof. Saad, do you want to share from a researcher perspective? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Prof. Saad, uh, I think, mentioned the first point, which is the talent. But uh, I, from the researcher or as um, an academic staff, I think the direction of the university, the leaderships, and the clear direction is very, very important. And that's actually what makes uh, make us work and focus, you know. So, as an academician, you you want the leadership. The leadership of the university makes the direction very clear. This is our target. This is our focus. And we have to engage in discussion. Why these discussions? We are academicians, so we 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 discuss. And that's what actually happens uh, in uh, HIR. There is a lot of discussions, and the, the the leadership of the university come forward and explain their rationals why they want to focus on this. And that's make us very clear and focus our target, our research, because. Many of the researchers actually do a very high quality work, but where this research ends, it depends on uh, the, the, the target. So for me, which as personal uh, experience, 
is the direction of the university helped me a lot. The clear directions and the focus and the targets and so on. That's actually plus the support. Because sometimes you may set the targets quite high and uh, you have to provide the support. And that actually uh, makes makes us work harder. Thank you. Right. Prof, Prof Chan, do you want to elaborate? Sorry, I think uh, in my last slide, I have actually uh, already alluded that uh, um, I have actually mentioned, uh, you know, it's all about, you know, uh, me, the science, as well as, of course, the institution. So I think, you know, it's all about your attitude, how you actually really want to, to, to stay hungry and uh, stay curious and so on. And, uh, and and you, you really target uh, to grow your science. And, and of course, you know, uh, I think uh, direction from the university, uh, the foresight, what's next for, for, for the researchers are also very important. So together, you know, uh, this makes a perfect recipe. Thank, thank you for that. So if I may sum up very quickly from Prof Chan, you mentioned about it is me, your focus, your attitude towards your science, doing good science to support, to help the community. From Prosad, it's about uh, the university leadership play a very important role, give clear direction, help researcher to focus and to, to be successful. And you mentioned about support, right? Can you elaborate a little bit more? What are the important support that researcher needs from the university to be successful? I think the, 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 the number one, which is the financial support, that's very important. I think in order for us to do high quality research, you need the financial support. And that's actually what makes it different because once you have the financial support, you can attract a good talent, you can have a good quality students because you pay for the, the, the talent. So we can attract good, you can have the up-to-date facilities which can put you in par with your competitors around the world. I think that in terms of ideas, in terms of uh, what to do, that is the job for the professors and the supervisors to define. But I think from the university, I think that's the two things that we need. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, we, we will revisit uh, the, the, the topic on talent, but now, now let's focus on certain aspect of during a presentation that you did share that, that your research productivity increases. You, there, there is a shift, in fact, in, in the type of talent that you recruit. The, the shift uh, post-HIR is to hire more PhD. Right. Now, the, the question to you is why? Why? What is the difference between uh, uh, having graduate student at PhD level or at the master level? How does that contribute to your productivity? Okay, I think uh, uh, we learn, you know, because we uh, we we learn from what we do. Uh, we, we started with masters. When we do for masters. Uh, after we train them, we spend a lot of time training them on uh, doing the research or writing the papers, and then they start publishing. And what happens is they will leave us. They go to Australia, to US, so everywhere. So we spend a lot of time actually training them. So our ROI, return of investment, was very low. Plus the the continuity of the project, because sometimes we have a, a long term project which we need the, uh, more time for the students. Master students usually within two years they finish. PhDs takes uh, four years, so that allow us to do to complete the project from the beginning till the end, and also the the productivity and the quality of what PhD student can produce is much much higher than uh, master students. So that's actually the main reasons uh, we learn. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof Chan, do you want to add to uh, any comment to what Prof Saad has shared? I think um, the, if I mean, uh, I think the moving forward, the best support that I would really want to see, it's actually uh, not, not, you know, support from students. 
uh, because like what uh, Professor I say, students come, students go, and you know, uh, there's no continuity in your project. There's no uh, continuity in your research and so on. And that's always, you know, uh, we need to let students go because they need to graduate. And uh, that's always, uh, you know, uh, um, a time frame, you know, putting, um, I don't know, we call it uh, graduate on time. So we need to make sure they graduate on time. We cannot give them challenging projects, two challenging projects which they cannot cope. Although we always give them plan A, plan B, you know, even plan C, sometimes they ended up not doing any much. Uh, so, so I think, you know, uh, moving forward to, to actually sustain culture of excellence, it's really having, you know, uh, 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 um, this um, lack, I mean, uh, forego, you know, strings attached to, you know, graduating students, but having postdocs in the lab, you know, uh, like the Western culture. I think the culture of postdocs is quite new in Malaysia, and I think it's very fortunate with HIR, we actually started this culture, and uh, uh, this culture should definitely be maintained. And, you know, with postdocs in the lab, uh, you actually build them up in a totally different way because, you know, uh, at the same time, it's a symbiosis. You you work together with, with the postdoc to build uh, his or her career. At the same time, you know, you, you guys are actually challenging yourself to more important questions in science. So moving Thank forward, I think that's that should be the way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Prof. Nosada from University Leaders Perspective. Now, there are two areas that is being mentioned, the culture of postdoc in University of Malaya and the, the number one support that is needed for researchers to do even better work, to grow even uh, more in their, their field, uh, it is funding. So do you want to comment about uh, what your department or the university are doing to support these two aspects? Yeah, um, of course. Um... Funding, uh, the second question is, uh, you know, very straightforward, I think. The, the answer is, yes, of course, funding is really uh, important. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is a tough time for us at the moment uh, with economic, uh, you know, uh, situation currently. But we try and, um, you know, without funding, things cannot move. We can't have postdocs, we can't have students, as Prof. Uh, Saad mentioned. And we have, uh, you know, equipment, but we cannot move the equipment, maybe because it breaks down and we need to repair. So we really need to have a, a, a support for funding. And, uh, you know, um, uh, we are a public university, so we depend very highly uh, on uh, government's uh, budget. But, uh, you know, the HIRs, uh, one of the, actually one of the objective um, of HIR is to make our researchers uh, very prominent and very well known that they are able to also not only attract students, uh, talents uh, from, you know, uh, good talents elsewhere, but also to attract funds into the university. Because by now, uh, you know, they are already internationally known. Their work is actually also known and, uh, you know, very highly cited. So they should be able to help the university attract funds uh, into the university, uh, especially research funds to um, help, you know, the university uh, help them in, uh, you know, them uh, moving forward in their research. Uh, as for postdoc, uh, yes, the culture is actually very new in, in Malaysia. Uh, although, you know, we are all um, aware of this because some of us were postdocs before as well. But it is a new new culture. But this is uh, this is also a very important one. Uh, university is, we know universities' uh, core business is actually training ground to actually uh, produce uh, more highly skilled and intellectuals, you know, for the nation. Okay, so... Of course, when you have students and, uh, you know, they need to graduate because that is a job of the university to actually produce them and let them go out and make, you know, the best of themselves out in the world. But uh, postdocs also probably will come through that way. But uh, I think in terms of postdoc, they are more, um, foc uh, more focused or should I say, they're more able to, to contribute um, more uh, as compared to a maybe PhD student, one, because they are more experienced. Second, because, you know, they don't have um, uh, something behind their back hanging, saying that, you know, I have to finish my thesis in three years or four years. You know, I do not want to be a student forever. So, uh, you know, uh, they will be able to contribute and give more uh, to the projects. Uh, but again, with this, uh, we need the support of the university as well as, you know, the funds. 
to uh, enable the postdocs to stay. So again, uh, it comes back to funding. Uh, and this is where HRR was able to help us a lot at that point in time, uh, you know, uh, in actually trying to uh, give us the support that we need to uh, research support in terms of uh, the funds to carry out the research as well as the funds to to uh, actually uh, employ uh, postdocs as well as uh, graduate uh, scholarships and fellowships for the graduate students so that they don't have to worry about where their money is going to come from to pay for the fees. and. Uh, but hopefully by now, you know, we have enough uh, talents or enough, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, researchers out there who are prominent enough to be able to uh, help us attract uh, more grants from other sources outside the government source. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, you ended a, a, a very interesting note. I think both Prof Saad and uh, Prof Chan did mention about they expand the source, their sources of funding beyond uh, Malaysia. So I wonder if they want to share their, their successful tips for the audience listening to both of you. Uh, Prof Chan, do you want to go ahead? So, um, of course, I think uh, uh, we will also, um, I think because I, I work with a team of two, my colleague and myself, so uh, so we actually are very lucky because uh, we we actually got approached by, you know, uh, uh, people working on Arbo viruses in the UK and uh, we, with that, uh, they, uh, we actually got an EU funding in I think in 2012 or something like that, 2010, and then subsequently they went on to apply welcome grant and uh, now they are in the process of applying the next welcome grant, which they are so happy to invite us. So I think, you know, it, it really comes with, you know, uh, when when you do, uh, uh, when you collaborate, when you actually apply funding people, you are serious about it, you do your best and uh, you prove that you can do it and you can do it people. So uh, that that will keep your collaboration um, ongoing and also um, I also have an open and one fellowship which I, I like it very much because it really helps me to even provide opportunity for my postgrad students to to go for training uh, so so my postgrad uh, student was able to go to uh, UC of St Andrews for attachment so I think you know grants like that has been very helpful to actually give an insight uh, you know what is research out there and uh, Give uh, you know students the international exposure, and and I think you know all these small small things are very important to to actually you know uh, in part of our training in science. Okay, thank you for that. In the interest of time, I will move on to the next topic, the networking and collaboration. Now, the question I have on this topic is: What is the main benefit or the main reason for research collaboration? Now, from the university leadership perspective, Prof. Nusada, you want to go ahead, then after which we ask Professor Saad to comment on researcher perspective. Of course, uh, from the university's perspective, um, you know, uh, uh, networking and collaboration is very, very important because, you know, that will put you uh, together with your peers uh, and they will, you know, be able to recognize uh, the achievement of the university. Um, uh, I don't like to say this because, of course, uh, you know, uh, academics and universities uh, do not actually want to say that ranking is very important. But, uh, you know, it, ranking is a place to benchmark uh, where we are. And, um, you know, and uh, with benchmarking, we know, uh, you know, how good we are. And But how do we benchmark this? So we need to actually also be known amongst our peers and our colleagues uh, out you know, uh, globally. So if a university is not recognized, um, you know, how would you be able to get, uh, you know, uh, people to work with you and, you know, other researchers, uh, and our researchers will have a tough time uh, trying to actually maybe uh, connect with, you know, good researchers out there. Uh, so collaboration helps us uh, in actually exposing and making university more visible uh, globally. In addition, uh, sometimes uh, collaboration helps um, because, you know, uh, we may, I mean, it, it allows us to work better as a team. We may not have enough, uh, you know, uh, experts in certain areas that, you know, the other universities may have. 
uh, we also may not have enough infrastructure or equipment that is required because, you know, uh, as we say now, in terms of funding, uh, very difficult for us to actually um, maybe acquire some uh, cutting edge, uh, you know, uh, equipment. But if we are actually collaborating and collaborating with the best in the world, they would probably also have, uh, you know, uh, resources that enable us to also uh, access, you know, their, their facilities. So it is a very important, uh, I mean, we live in this world, uh, in spite of the pa pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic, human is a social animal. So, you know, uh, for university, we really have to, you know, be, be out there and known uh, and worked and networked uh, globally for, you know, for the benefit of everybody. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Prof Saad, you want to comment? Quick one. Yeah, yeah, I think Prof Sada have put it all, you know, together, you know, so uh, from the researcher's perspective, I think collaboration is very, very important. Uh, what keep us survive is the collaborations. Uh, you know, your research output, as you know, it does not, uh, it's not constant. It's not something you put in, you go out. But what makes you sustain is the collaboration, because sometimes you work as a team, so you contribute some parts, the other team contributes to some parts, and also this will help us also to do quality work, because you have input from different uh, people, from different angles, from different views. So actually that will always add value to the, to the work that we do in terms of, in terms of publications, in terms of uh, culture of doing the research, in terms of the way how you present your research, that's actually helps me a lot. I personally learn a lot from my collaborators and also I think they have learned from me, I hope so. And also from very important, I think also this one, uh, in terms of, um, we did some analysis on citations per paper and actually we found actually papers with, uh, with the multiple institutions or different countries tend to have more citations compared to single uh, affiliations. Right? Really, that's maybe also a very important aspect. Thank, thank, you. thank you. for Thank you for that. A quick summary. So collaboration is important because it gives you higher impact. It helps you to achieve greater visibility, whether individual researcher or university. Collaboration also through collaboration, you can leverage on uh, your team expertise, diversify the skill to solve bigger science problem. You can leverage on more advanced equipment. Of course, uh, must mention there will be an alternative source of funding. So that's the benefit of collaboration. Prof. Saad, this question I want to uh, target specifically uh, uh, with you. you. You have published 26 highly cited uh, articles. These are global top 1% in terms of citation impact, of which 16 is reviewed, 10 is articles. But if I look at your profile, you still publish significant number, 135 proceeding. Why do you need to do that? What's the benefit yeah. of publishing proceeding? Thank you very much. Actually, uh, publishing in proceeding or attending conference is very, very important. I know uh, when especially specialized conferences, especially the specialized, very focused conferences, because through the conferences, one, you will do the networking, you meet people, the expert in your area, and you can engage in discussions and initiate collaborations. Number two, the conferences provide the fast uh, process of publication. You know, it does not, the process to publish a paper is usually very fast compared to a journal paper. So actually through that, you protect the ideas. It means you will be protecting your ideas, publishing it in the conference, later on you come back, upgrade the contents and then you submit it as a journal papers by even you have to cite actually you have to indicate this paper uh, the part of this paper has been published before i think that's very very important protecting the the novel ideas which is because very fast publications second is networking and then learning also we go to these conferences where you meet people from uh, different countries, especially in the specialized in your area. So you learn new ideas. You see the directions where it is heading, so you can tune your work towards what they are doing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, I, I, unfortunately, I think we run out of our time for the panel discussion. In the interest of time, we want to take uh, questions from the audience, and I will. Uh, pass this on to my colleague Clarice, who will be moderating the question and answer session. Clarice, you want to take over? 
Hi, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, thank you for the questions that's coming in, uh, many of them actually, uh, but in view of the time that we have, we may not be able to answer all questions from the floor. So, uh, we'll answer uh, after this webinar. So, there will be a few questions posed to our panelists at the moment. Um, this first question, mainly to Prof Nostada, um, would you elaborate the process involved between UN and students for the publication of the HRR papers, the high impact research papers, please? Um, I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat the, the question because it's not very clear to me? Uh, would you elaborate the process involved between University of Malaya and the student for the publication of a high impact research paper? So it's between students and the university? Uh, okay, um, how the process, um, actually in University of Malaya, we have uh, under the academic, uh, you know, guidance for uh, graduation, the students have to publish, um, you know, um, at least two papers. Uh, this is real published, uh, accepted, not just submitted. Um, and, uh, you know, and for um, particularly for the uh, science, engineering, uh, medical and technology area, uh, they have to publish in um, WS indexed uh, journal uh, to, any, to ensure that, you know, uh, the work that is being carried out uh, is actually of quality because uh, we believe that, you know, uh, of course, the thesis will be examined. But, uh, you know, if you actually have published a paper, which is also being reviewed by, you know, um, your peers outside, then you know that the work is actually of quality because now we do not know who is actually reviewing our paper, right? So if it's accepted and uh, published, then, uh, you know, you know that the work is good. So um, uh, that's why, uh, you know, you know, Simlaya actually uh, have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, requirement for students to uh, publish uh, before graduation. Of course, uh, you know, uh, the supervisor is there to guide them because uh, we know that um, as a student uh, doing PhD, most of them, uh, if, you know, uh, a majority of them will, will go out to become, um, uh, you know, principal investigator or, you know, uh, independent investigator or researcher themselves. And most likely they will be in the universities that will be, you know, requiring all these um, skills. So uh, the supervisors will actually have to get guide and will be guiding the uh, you know hopefully the the uh, you know students uh, in terms of how to publish and where to publish uh, you know uh, to enable them to learn this so that when they actually graduate and actually go out to become an independent researcher they will be able to do this themselves because they'll not be able to rely on the supervisor forever. I hope that answers yeah. the question. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of how to write a paper, I believe uh, this question is on uh, the minds of a lot of early career researchers out there. Um, so what advice do you give to students who are struggling to follow the pathway of global writing style, you know, with an emphasis on reputable writing format, you know, writing in a natural flow, uh, if I may uh, elaborate. So could you also share in detail on what is actually the format of natural writing for scientific papers? So this question can be posed to um, all the panelists uh, who would like to, you know, answer this question. Maybe I can uh, can uh, try to answer these questions. You know, so for me, the basic principles of writing: uh, before you become a writer, you have to be a good reader first. You cannot write the papers without reading. You know, that, that's why we, we, what we do, we encourage our students, especially in the first six months when they join PhD students, uh, to read as many as possible paper in the area. So when you read the papers, so you get the feeling, you get the style, you get the format, you get the, the way how the, the paper, and different journals may have a different, different way, but true reading, when you encourage the student to read, the students actually will, you will acquire the way how you present your work. So actually that's the, the, the best, the best advice, which I advise my students is to read as many as possible. And then as you progress, you're reading maybe at the first paper, you read from the title up to the references. And then later on you will progress, you're reading, uh, we, you will know how, which part of the paper you read and so on and so forth. So that's my, uh, my personal, yeah, advice. 
Thank you, Prof. Zach. Uh, thanks for taking the uh, question since uh, you are active. I'm going to ask you this. Um, you have actually achieved very amazing achievements, uh, you know, 17 years after receiving, receiving a PhD. So when the HR program started, uh, how was your workload in terms of undergrad teaching and admin work, and how do you manage your time and energy? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think this is a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, teach our, uh, in our university teaching load is not very high, actually. It's, uh, we teach around nine, nine hours per, per year in average, so it's not very high anyway. Uh, and as a professor, I, I, I always do want to, to cut my relationship with my students. I always want to teach. You know, even I don't have class. I, even now I'm the dean, I, I suppose not to teach, but I still do teaching because I believe in one thing, you know. The professor or the researchers, you must keep your relationship with the students because that's your source, you know, where you pick up the good talents that you join your group. Yes, time management is very important. Uh, but as I say, very, very, the HIR, the HIR, we work as a team. You know, we have a group of people, we work as a team, and uh, we try to, 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 I call, to, um, to divide the job. But just to be honest with you, in the last 20 years, actually, I work equivalent to more than 40 years, you know, in terms of time that I have spent on my research. It's not, the research, in order for you to get good work, good results, you need to spend quality time. You have to spend the way. There is nothing comes on touch and go. You need the time. You need the focus. You need the energy. I think I mentioned this in one occasion to Professor Ada. You know, in the last twenty years, actually, I work equivalent to forty years, and I'm happy with it. I'm happy because I can see the result, and uh, I'm happy to see my students graduating, and also I'm very happy to contribute to the University of Malaya, who helped me actually to reach what I am now. Thank you, Prof. Saad. Um, there's this next question uh, to Dr. Chan. Um, you have, you know, uh, you have demonstrated that uh, you are able to collaborate with partners from various countries. Um, how do you develop this project with these partners in these countries? Um, is this facilitated, facilitated by University of Malaya or is uh, based from your personal network? Um, okay, so, uh, for example, you know, uh, I think most of it, it's actually, uh, it's very specific. For example, uh, like I work with, uh, Singapore, it's, it's really, uh, uh, through the grant collaboration. So, uh, when we, I mean, we, we actually move, uh, you know, from the grant collaboration, we do something extra. So therefore, we actually uh, 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 works uh, on other extra things, and therefore that resulted in a uh, good publication. So in other instances, uh, like for example, you know, in the last five years, um, I I actually uh, co-authored some papers with uh, you know Japan and so on. So that really comes from you know uh, when uh, my my paper is published and uh, they got interested and we started discussing uh, you know uh, about about the work and and then uh, I actually provide you know input uh, you know what what what's what should we. Uh, look at you know the angle of of the research and so on, and that's where we actually co-publish together. So I think um, you know those are some of the examples of uh, you know uh, uh, collaboration that you actually don't really meet in person, but you actually ended up you know uh, uh, because they know your papers, uh, they know your work, and they were more interested in uh, uh, seeing what you have. Uh, you know how how much you know in the field, and and therefore your expertise is actually needed. So so that actually uh, has been forthcoming, and uh, that also resulted in uh, you know I'm also uh, uh, working with an Imperial College to do some epidemiology modeling on 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 the disease, and of course locally uh, because of uh, you know different funding mechanism. Uh, for example, uh, we recently in UM we launched a uh, uh, funding mechanism which requires you know uh, uh, different discipline, interdisciplinary, and also from different faculty. So I started looking for you know uh, uh, computer scientists as well as you know uh, uh, 
professional, you know, uh, really teachers, you know, educationists who can actually, you know, tell me how should I make my, you know, how 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 can I be more effective in 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 actually combating, you know, infectious diseases. So we actually make education modules. We actually uh, uh, use artificial intelligence to predict uh, uh, diseases. So all these are very exciting collaboration at the moment. Some of them comes with funding, some of them don't come with funding. So, of course, you know, uh, you know, it's always a stepping stone when, you know, uh, when, when first you initiated without funding and then uh, some of this, you know, it ended up, uh, I also have opportunities like uh, sending students to, to, to provide, to do training. So, some, some of this comes with funding, some of this come with training, some of this actually come with uh, resulted in publication. So, I think, you know, um, it, it it actually benefited uh, 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 us a lot. Right, right. Um, earlier on, you were sharing about grant, and uh, how were you? Uh, what advice would you give to the audience on increasing your chance of getting a grant approved? Because you know you'll be compet you'll be competing with you know researchers from top world universities. How do you overcome that? Um, so as I also. Uh, have seen, you know, how we, how my collaborator applied Welcome Trust. I also see through uh, how bad, how poorly written are our grants in, 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 I mean, I personally don't write that well. So, so I think, you know, I, I learned a lot through the process of, uh, you know, when I applied Newton Advanced Fellowship, I see how my collaborator write grants and, and I, of course, learn from the process. So I think it is, we are not getting grants because we are not writing it well. We are not writing to target it correctly. So I think, you know, uh, uh, having, you know, very targeted, uh, for example, uh, grant writing uh, uh, workshops, it, it's very helpful in the sense that um, I actually went to uh, uh, a US defense threat reduction agency grant writing for uh, two, uh, two weeks. And we really wrote a proposal which we submitted. So I think you know uh, efforts are required. Really, a lot, a lot of efforts. So of course, sometimes we are lucky. You know, we we write one thing, and uh, you know, uh, we we got funded because it's actually applying uh, uh, right right grant at the right time. For example, if you are applying for you know you have something related to COVID nineteen, and and you meet the call, so you you will likely get it if. You are actually working on very important, uh, 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 you know, aspect. So, so I think very important is we must know, you know, whether we fit into the core of the grant. Uh, what what is the nature of the grant? You know, so if if you know, for example, I knew very well, like Laurie UNESCO, it is really to look at your your uh, your innovation. For example, you know, the uh, uh, how your science is translated to to uh, useful. Uh, uh, practices are useful for the for the community. So, so you need to be able to show your your signs as well as you know how potentially it can be. It it will be useful. It will be an antiviral. It will be a vaccine or or whatever. So, so I think you know sometimes we we don't write well and uh, we think people understand us. So, so I think it's more like polishing our 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 grand writing. Thank you, Dr. Chan. Uh, the next question will be for Prof. Nosada, um, relating to setting of, uh, you know, key performance indicators. So, other than setting KPIs that push, you know, faculty to publish papers, um, are there other ways that uh, you can motivate faculty in a non-KPI approach? And uh, second, second part of this question is, how do you then recruit, uh, you know, talented candidates to become your Students or your uh, faculty members, Prognosala. Uh, not a very easy question. That, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, well, we we look at the KPI and what is needed. Uh, actually, uh, as a university overall, okay. Uh, you know what we expect uh, the university to produce within a certain year, uh, within the year, for example, and it's cascaded down to you know the faculty and down to the researchers and the staff. So uh, it's a yearly event that you know uh, 
for example, Prof Saad will tell you that I will have a big fight with, you know, the dean saying that, okay, I don't care. This is the KPI that you have and you have to work with it. And, uh, you know, and then he will come back and tell me, you know, uh, you know, this is not possible because we have this number of staff. But whatever it is, uh, you know, we try to actually be as, um, uh, you know, as uh, as realistic as possible, uh, you know, because not everybody can publish. Uh, so it's a, it's a teamwork, it's a shared effort. Those who can publish uh, journals should be publishing, you know, them. Uh, and those who can publish, uh, you know, better in books, maybe, I mean, uh, then uh, they they can publish books. Those who do not have grants, you know, may not be able to, uh, to write papers uh, that year because they don't have enough funding to support their research. Then, uh, you know, we hope we were hoping that they will actually help in uh, you know uh, uh, extra teaching to to give uh, you know those who have grants uh, more time to actually um, you know achieve the milestones and complete the projects. So you know the KPI is uh, one of the things that uh, you know I think we use uh, in order to actually help us uh, you know drive the productivity of the university, and it has been working. We don't have um, we used to have incentive other incentives, but we stopped that in 2014. We do not have any other incentive, but I'm happy to say that, you know, our researchers are um, actually, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the, the research culture and excellence is there, you know, that we do not have to actually, uh, you know, incentivize people in other ways, uh, you know, as so as to actually uh, uh, for them to be productive because they know that that is, what they're supposed to do, okay? Uh, it is already built into, into them that, you know, they have to, I mean, this is part of the job that they have to do. We do have other incentives, like uh, we, yearly we have uh, special awards, uh, you know, at the university, you know, uh, the best, like, you know, uh, the highest number of, uh, you know, publication, the highest number of citation, uh, you know, uh, but that only goes to 1% out of the 2000 or so, uh, you know, staff we have uh, on campus. Uh, how do we recruit students? Uh, uh, okay, we actually, um, uh, the, the way the, the recruitment goes is through the faculties. Uh, also, uh, uh, in terms of staff, the way the faculty is, uh, uh, I mean, the faculty is being uh, recruited is uh, based on what, you know, the other members at the faculty do. We are actually uh, relooking at the way we actually recruit, uh, you know, uh, staff at the moment. Uh, previously, it is, um, you know, they would be applying to the the faculty, and then there would be an interview at the faculty, and then there'll be subs subsequently interview at the central level, uh, you know, uh, before we decide that, uh, you know, uh, whether they're successful or not. But now uh, we are actually looking at it in a more uh, different, in a different manner. Uh, so, uh, which, uh, you know, we're still studying whether it's going to be uh, visible, uh, feasible for us to do it that way. In terms of students, um, uh, it is at the faculty level. Uh, actually, we do recruit, and there is, of course, uh, you know, certain requirement um, before you can apply to be a PhD student, for example. You know, your undergraduate uh, must be uh, from uh, uh, the, the uh, university that is recognized, uh, you know. Uh, and accredited, et cetera, et cetera. But when the students come in, uh, they would have to do a proposal uh, uh, defense, uh, which is uh, just a training for them to give a, a, maybe a public talk. Uh, but subsequently, they will have to do a candidature defense after they've done their work. So this is where we weigh whether the students are ready to actually move forward to do their PhD uh, you know, or not. Okay, so in that case, um, once we get to the candidature defense, uh, you know, the students may fail and not go further ahead. So, you know, uh, this, we hope that this mechanism actually ensures, you know, uh, talents uh, to come in and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, move forward to finally graduate with their doctorate. Um, but um, I have to say that, you know, the supervisor uh, play a very major role in this. Because if the supervisor do not actually work with the students, uh, the researcher and the supervisor, then uh, you know the students will not be able to move, uh, and uh, will eventually not, uh, uh, you know, uh, success uh, succeed in uh, finishing their PhD. So it's actually the major role of the supervisor. Right, right. Thank you, Professor Zada. Um, 
now we have actually, uh, you know, kind of overrun our time. So uh, apologies in advance that uh, we couldn't answer, you know, most of the questions that came in. So thank you very much for your valuable input and sharing, uh, Prof. Nasada, Prof. Saad, and Dr. Chan. And to the attendees in the audience, thank you very much for listening in. Your questions have made this session very engaging. Well, we have come to the end of this webinar. If you have any inquiries or questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Our contact details are indicated on this slide. And uh, one last request before you go, a survey will appear just right after you close the window of this webinar. We appreciate your valuable feedback and inputs through this survey form, and we wish you a good rest of the day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Nosada. Thank you, Dr. Chan and Dr. Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye.